the candidature of possibilities how to be a candidate of the possibilities at hand let's first go to the book of nehum chapter 3 it says war to the bloody city it is all full of lies and robbery the prey departeth not the noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots the horse man lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear and there is a multitude of the slain and a great number of carcasses and there is none end of their corpses they stumble upon their corpses because of the multitude of the hordoms of the well favored harlot the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her hordoms and families through her witchcrafts behold i am against thee saith the lord of hosts now discover thy scars upon thy face now shew the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame now cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and I will set thee as a gazing stock and shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say Nineveh is laid waste who will be more in her when shall I seek comforters for thee art thou better take note of us eight art thou better than populous no that was situate among the rivers that had the waters round about it whose rampart was the sea and her wall was from the sea ethiopia and egypt were her strength and it was infinite take note of that that it was infinite put and lubim were thy helpers yet was she carried and she went into captivity her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets and they cast lots of her honorable men and all her great were bound in chains thou also shall be drunk thou shall be hid thou also shall seek strength because of the enemy all thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the fast ripe figs if they be shaken they shall even fall into the mouth of the water rather than the mouth of the eater so that is nehum chapter 3 from verse 1 to 12 we can go to isaiah chapter 61 Verse 8 he says for I the Lord love judgment I hate robbery for burnt offering and direct their work in truth and I will make an everlasting covenant with them and their seed shall be known among the gentiles and their offspring among the people all that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels verse 11 for as the earth bringeth forth her bud and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth so the lord god will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations on tuesday we were looking at the infrastructure of possibilities and it's my prayer that god was able to communicate some everlasting truths to your heart on tuesday today we will pick it in the same vein and inflect it towards the candidature of possibilities is at your right hand of dominion 
Father, I thank you for mercy. I thank you for the anointing. Lord, we are unhungered. He says, Verily, thou shalt be fed. Feed us, for you have a capacity to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The candidature of possibilities. Let's go back to the book of Nahum, chapter 3. So we began to uh, talk about what we called the nation as a nexus of interest. The nation of Kenya as a nexus of interest. Because you cannot understand what we are doing here, or what we are doing here can be very confusing if you don't want to appreciate what Kenya is as a nexus of interest. We are not just a people, but we are a nation. We're not just a nation. We have been sent to a nation, and we have not just been sent to a nation. Our commissioning as the blessing of Jabez was has been enlarged by it, its costs to be able to lay claim of the rest of the nations of the earth. And it is such understanding that begins to open up territories of understanding for us, even in a season like this, to be able to catapult us to the destiny that God has prepared for us. So my preamble is exactly that, the nation as a nexus of interest. Your neighbor will sakai you in both the spelling and the meaning of the word nexus. The nation as a nexus of interest. Look at these scriptures, brethren. These are precious scriptures, I tell you. Verse 8. Art thou better than popular snow, that was situated among the rivers, that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her wall was from the sea? Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubim were thy helpers. So, God began to speak to this nation through the seasonal utterance that he has given us. And he began to say the things that are, I reiterated to you right here in this auditorium. He began to say that your contradiction is because of your garden positioning. Your contradiction is because of your garden positioning. So he has already begun the narrative from verse 1. He has talked about how the city is bloody and we don't need to go into the detail of the people that have died in the church itself. He went on to say how carcasses have been spewn. Carcasses in the realm of grace and the anointing have been spewn across the territory. He went on to say how the land now is in charge of a harlot and a mistress of witchcrafts. And that is the mistress we are exporting abroad, right? in the name of a prophetess. So she's the one that is manning over the territory. And now she, ca she comes here with a lot of legality because the blood and the robberies and the lies that have accentuated our desolation have become her definite grounding. God help us. Are you following me? So when he came to verse 8, he began to say that your contradiction is due to your garden positioning. Then he began to say something that I will beseech you to follow through. He began to say, are you better than popular snow? Are you better than popular snow? For students of history in the house, popular snow is Thebes, Thebes that was situated across the valley of the kings in Egypt. And popular snow is a portal that God opened over the surface of the earth. Populous no was a portal that God opened over the surface of the earth 
to replace the physical Eden. Now, Eden, of course, uh, ended up having several peculiarities because Eden was both a spiritual manifestation and a physical manifestation. So we do know that a sword was put there, all right? Bonasesan, uh, wielded by a cherubim to ensure that no man goes back to the physical Eden. So from that time, it has been a matter of guesswork exactly where the physical location of Eden was. So as soon as that is removed, we ended up having two other stations that were critical on the surface of the earth. There was a space called Nod where Cain went that was away from the presence of God. So that ground itself was away from the presence of God. But then God raised another space that he called No, or it was called Thebes by um, Egyptologists and historians, that was supposed to be a physical replacement of the portal that he had opened over Eden. So Eden cannot be accessed because it is a peculiar space, both in the natural and in the spirit. But so that, listen, so that the sword of the cherubim does not become a legality against the access of the spiritual Eden. So that the sword that was being wielded by the cherubim to hinder Adam from accessing Eden does not become a legality in the realm of the spirit. God had to move in compassion and mercy and establish another physical location. Now this physical location was as Eden because Eden was a space of rivers and waters and a boundless sea. It was such a space. So this no had to become an equivalent. No had to become an equivalent. It had to become a space of rivers and waters and down there we study about fig trees because remember I told you and I will say this without fear of contradiction, that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a fig tree. So you read that scripture, a few verses down there, you'll see what I'm talking about. Are you following me? So we still have a garden space, a physical space, that is an equivalent and a replacement of the other space we've been pushed to. And the reasons why God is settling for this is because he does not want the sword that is manning the physical Eden to become a legality in the realms of the spirit to hinder us from accessing the spiritual Eden because if we can access the spiritual Eden we can still create a physical Eden what we are going to do in our generation are you following me so he dashed and came to a space that is called popular snow and from that day from the day that decision was made Egypt has remained to be a center place of all the civilizations of the world. There is no civilization without Egypt. In fact, there is no written language without Egypt. There is no spoken language without Egypt. There are no books. There is no time. There is no science. There, are, there is no mathematics. There is nothing to the human capacitations of modern day enlightenment without the mystery that became Egypt. So Egypt occupied that space. But then there was a twist because man is removed from the physical Eden and God supplies another Eden. Are you following me? He's removed and God supplies another. But then a physical serpent has entered the space of Eden and that physical serpent must become a spiritual serpent as well. The reasons to why it accessed the physical garden is so that it can lay claim of a spiritual space. So when we went to popular snow, my goodness, when we went to popular snow, we did not factor in that there is a space of a serpent in that heavenlies. So we have substituted Eden, but we are yet to cast down that serpent that is in the heavenlies. Now it is this serpent that became the informant of the demonic civilization that Egypt gave the world. Because from that space now, what we began to do is to ascend. And as we ascended, because we are supposed to lay claim of the entire territory of the spirit over this replacement 
of the Garden of Eden and manifest a space that has now been redeemed that is equivalent to the Eden from which you've been pushed. Are you following me? Are you following me? So that is what we are supposed to do. But then we failed to do it in that to this day the symbol of Egypt is a serpent. What Pharaoh was wearing was serpentine. Egypt ended up giving us a book of death instead of a book of life. We ended up having the valley of not just the kings, but the valley of the sepulchres of the kings in Egypt. It became such a strong manifestation of the reign of the serpent. It is unbelievable to this day. And I would advise you to become an Egyptologist so that you can see how far darkness can go. I mean, whether you're talking about its priests, you're talking about its waters, all right? How Pharaoh was able to network with the gates of hell in Lake Victoria and manifest a serpentine kingdom over the territory that is now Egypt. So are you better than, are you better than, that is a question. Now, I am yet to decode for you what Africa is. And in the days to come, God shall anoint me with an utterance to be able to furnish you with what Africa is and what Africans are and how we came to where we are so that you can understand not how unfortunate things have worked for you, but so that you can have a fuller comprehension of where you are right now, how strategic you are for the kingdom of God in this generation. When I have taught you that, you shall really appreciate your dark skin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And those whose skin texture is almost like those of the white men. You will appreciate that you fell short of that attainment. Before they classify me rather as, as ratio, let me continue with what I was saying. That brethren, this is where we are. That now we have a garden expression. And God was in Egypt. God was in Egypt. The kingdom was first manifested in Egypt. Civilization was first expressed and consolidated in Egypt. Forget about uh, Mesopotamia, where there is, quote-unquote, agrarian revolution, where they knew how to grow rice because there were plantar waters. We are talking about Egypt. Egypt gave us the first book of wisdom concerning which Solomon would be commended for, for he says that his wisdom was greater than the wisdom of Egypt. And Egypt was such a portal that Solomon married the daughter of Pharaoh, if only to bring that expression of civilization to his doorstep. And that is why most of us don't appreciate how great those blacks were, because they were black men. Because when you read the scriptures, you begin asking yourself why Joseph did not go back home when he was released from being a prisoner. But Egypt was the United States of America. Just here in Nairobi, how many people have come back after getting opportunities in New York? Just here in Nairobi. Because you read Bible characters and you're too quick to judge them. <laughs> I mean, nurses. Eh? In New York, that are called Wanjiko. Eh? Nafula. How many of them have been eager to come home? You can't come home. You're in the capital of the world. Only God could remove Egypt because it was a superpower for a millennium. And it founded the civilization of the world until the return of Jesus Christ. Egypt is where the supremacy of human manifestation existed. And I believe by extension, still exists. Now, 
when God is now picturing what Kenya is supposed to be because Egypt was completely desecrated by Mohammedans the Islamic spirit took over and desecrated the space to no return I mean we cannot now begin to talk about how to resuscitate the spiritual spaces that Egypt had because Muhammad has already obliterated them so when God is considering Kenya what he's beginning to do is to say are you better than so when I saw that scripture the Spirit of the Lord began to minister to me because the point was you are supposed to be better than popular snow you are supposed to be better than popular snow in other words now you are not supposed to sit around physical rivers such as the one which the daughter of Pharaoh went to take a bath from you're not supposed to sit around physical rivers but you're supposed to be such a strong manifestation of a spiritual Eden so much so that the world not just the ground beneath you the world as an earth is affected by the spiritual garden in your nation are you better than because the challenge has always been to be better than popular snow are you better than popular snow oh blessed be the name of the lord that there were rivers there were rivers so in this nation in the realm of the spirit there's a very peculiar glory gate there are glory gates in this nation there are waters round about which means that we are manning the revelation of God in a space that can only be said to have an isolated manifestation. That what God is going to do in Kenya, he has never done in any other nation. From the time Jesus ascended to sit at the right hand side of God, you are surrounded by waters. Your manifestation is very isolated. And that is why I said our revelation is isolated that is why our approach is isolated and that is why our mindset is isolated that your rampart or stronghold or bulwarks are from the sea that is uncongenial understanding uncongenial understanding informed by novelties of depth uncongenial understanding informed by novelties of depth so when we sit here there is a depth that God will give to us through trusteeship and through the privilege of us being Kenyans and through the fact that we have been brought to such a Christ crucified space. They, they are handlings we shall have and it is not possible to even begin to say that they, they will only be scriptural. The scriptural understanding or depth or seaship is only the beginning. We shall have prophetic depth we shall have power depth. We shall have authority depth. We shall have a depth that is so compound, so far-reaching, so consolidating, all right, across all the known revelations of redemption because my rampant must come from the sea. So God began to speak concerning this nation and began to say that Ethiopia and Egypt were thy strength. So what is your strength? Your strength is a ground mindset your strength is a ground world egypt because egypt gave the earth a world egypt gave the earth a world and that is why egypt and kenya in fact egypt is the closest nation to the manifestation of what kenya is and what kenya will be because egypt gave the earth a world the very same way i've told you time and time again that we owe as Kenyans, we owe the earth a world. You have no idea what I'm talking about until you have a look at what Egypt was able to do and then you come to these diminutives of metaverse, all right, and AI and these things that people are trying to do to accomplish certain realities within given timelines. But Kenya, though in the order of Egypt, just as Jesus was in the order of Melchizedek, is going to give the earth a world at such a time when we cannot do with the current world. The current world is already so arrested by the vicissitudes of the new world order. We are already so shackled by 
patterns of plagues that have already been set in motion and that cannot be changed it's supposed to continue like that there are things that the earth has decided to lay hold of and to continue in that cannot be changed unless a Kenyan has a reason Ethiopia mindset, Egypt, world, put, bo, bo, put, bo. Where are you getting that? Verse 9. It says, and it was infinite. Put and lubim were thy helpers. Put and lubim were thy helpers. So from this nation, we have a put space or a put uh, gracing, which is a bow, to be able to cast and to shoot arrows into the rest of the world and there are some kenyans that have been able to demonstrate this whether from the standpoint of the kingdom of darkness or from the kingdom of light men like barack obama were able to demonstrate that you can come here and go and rule the world those who are foreigners of things that are supposed to begin manifesting themselves because put is here put is here lubim is also here Brethren, Lubim is here. And what is Lubim? Lubim is a ground. Lubim is a ground. So I don't know what other seeds or laws of growth exist in other nations, but the ground we have here can cause things to grow. I had somebody say that Jumia was nothing until it came to, it came to Kenya. Because Kenya, there's a very peculiar ground. If you prevail here, you can prevail everywhere. So earlier prophets began to say that, that this is an altar nation. Because in an altar nation, we have a law that instructs the laws of any other nation. And that is a revelation that I came to improve for you. That we are not just an altar nation. In a sense of an administrative center of spiritual realities and systems. We are a ground and a garden from where to superimpose the perfect and the excellent will of God across the realms of the earth. So Egypt and Ethiopia, he says what? What is strength? And it was infinite. It was infinite. Your strength was infinite. Your strength was infinite. So in these last days, God has brought Egypt, Ethiopia, Lubim, and, and put all of them together to manifest a ground that is called Kenya. And that is why when we began to press into the spaces of this city, when God sent us here, we called Nairobi the city of waters. Some of you can recall that have long called this city a city of waters because that time the prophetic anointing within me was already laying claim for the destiny, not just of the city, but of the nation. And that is why God will grace us to establish a capital altar that can gift this nation with Egypt, with Ethiopia, with Put, and with Lubim. He says your strength was infinite because when these four are brought together, there is no potential that Kenya does not have. There is no potency that a Kenyan does not have. And there is no impossibility in your life. I came to prophesy this night in the name of Jesus Christ that there is no impossibility in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. That strength was infinite. That strength was infinite. Because if you take a mindset and you put it in a world or you create a world out of a mindset or you stand upon a world and begin to administrate the realities therewith through a mindset, you have no impossibilities. So I came to declare that that shall be your portion in Jesus' name. So all thy strongholds shall be like fig trees. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees. In other words, all thy strongholds, all your expressions shall come back to Christ crucified because it is through Christ crucified that God was able to reconcile the perfect will of a tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That tree was lost to the hand of the enemy in the Garden of Eden. And through the crucifixion of Christ, we are able to go back for it and reclaim it from his hand. 
it is this generation that shall stand before Lucifer and say, give me back the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So when Jesus came, it was not time. I'm saying something. When Jesus came, it was not time to reconcile that tree to the purposes of divinity. It wasn't time. So what he did is that he cast it. All right? For he says that cast is he that is hung on a tree. He cast it. So he came to a fig tree, right? And it was a season of figs. And he looked up to it, and there were no figs, right? What did he do? He talked to me. What did he do? He, he cast the tree. So the tree spent 4,000 years under a curse. The tree spent 4,000 years under a curse. When Jesus came, he did not find fruit upon it because the tree could not have fruit. Again, it's the tree of life. Because Jesus came as a tree of life. So the, the tree could not have fruit against it. Because the manifestation of the tree of life meant that there is no tree called the knowledge of evil that could have fruit. As long as the tree of life through the birth of Jesus had been manifested, it meant that there could be no fruit upon the tree of evil as long as Jesus was. As long as Jesus was. So that's why he says that as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So as long as this light was in the world, the tree of evil could not manifest fruit. So he cast it. But the casting only meant that the tree remained in the custody of the kingdom of darkness. So it is us who are gathered here tonight. If God can give us grace to see what kind of an epoch we are in, to withstand the devil, just as Angel Michael did, because we have higher authority than him in Christ, and tell the devil, give us back the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, listen to me, that will, in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, will became evil, all right? That's why Apostle Paul said that you were once darkness. So you are not people, you are, you are darkness, why? Because will became what? Will became evil through the ministry of the usurping serpent. But now in us and through us, will shall become wisdom. Will shall become wisdom. So the knowledge of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil surmised for your understanding is wisdom. But if that is under the subjugation of the serpent, that is the knowledge of evil. So we do 4,000 years. Are you following me? We do 4,000 years. And men like Ahaz ascend into branches in this tree. They eat this fruit and they shut down the kingdom. And we go to exile. Jesus comes, look at the, looks at the tree. And by the time he is bathed through the intercessory work of Simon and prophetess Anna, he shut down. As soon as he touched base physically, he shut down the physical fruit of the fig tree. When he comes there, he's in his heart, he was, I knew you wouldn't be having fruit because that would negate my physical manifestation. And he cast it. And then the kingdom of heaven began to tarry and to wait for a generation that would come packed and incarnated by revelation and lay claim of this tree from the hand of the enemy. That is why you are seated here tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. It says, all thy strongholds shall be like fig trees. So our stronghold is wisdom. Kenya's stronghold is wisdom. Put me anywhere with any other nationality. Take somebody from the Netherlands, put them there. Take somebody from uh, Namibia, put them there. Take somebody from Scotland, put them there. William will have wisdom. That is my stronghold. I'm saying something. As a Kenyan, you are supposed to have wisdom. When I begin to speak, eh? Nigerians should listen to my wisdom. I'm saying something. If you ha have a business and there's a Canadian there and there is an Uruguayan eh? in that assembly, wisdom should come from you because that is a stronghold you've been given. It's time to know what you have because then you'll know how to get what you don't have. I'm saying something. But how can Kenya get wisdom 
unless it is a church that is giving it wisdom. Because the nation will not have what the church does not have. So the church will always stand in a generation and say such as I have. So such as I have, I give unto, unto you. So why is the church crippled at a beautiful gate called the rivers of Eden? Why is it crippled at that point? It is because the church has not yet been able to give them such as they have through the manifestation of wisdom. It is our work to superimpose. I saying, I'm saying something. To dispense, to impart wisdom across all the 42 tribes of this nation. A fig tree must become your stronghold. A fig tree must become your stronghold. In the name of Jesus Christ. Oh wow. So this is happening against a very interesting backdrop. What we called the, the panorama of, diso, of desecrations, not desolations, the panorama of desecrations. And you'll have a look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. So he says, from the time the daily sacrifice is taken away. So how are we here? Now that we had such a promise of being better than popular snow, how are we here? And Daniel responded to us. He told us that the daily sacrifice was taken away. What does that mean? The territory's capital altar fell into the hands of the enemy. The territory's capital altar fell into the hand of the enemy. Then he begins to say the abomination that maketh desolate. What is the abomination? A blood that was shed in the church and sealed its usurpation. A blood that was shed in the church and sealed its usurpation. So there are certain church fathers in this nation that are responsible for shedding a blood that usurped our power. He said for how long? He says from this time when the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate. How long is that? 1,290 days, right? Which is the full tenure. Are you there? The book of Daniel? The full tenure of confusion and decimations. The full tenure of confusion and decimations. So this is the promise we had as a nation. And that is informing our assignment as a ministry. But why are we in this space? Because of Daniel 12, 11. The decimation of the capital altar, the abomination that maketh desolate, which is a blood that was shed, and then a number of days were given, which is 1,290 days in the realms of the spirit, so that that desecration can have a full tenure. Are you following me? So God did not stand there and say, oh, you have done this. Let's correct it immediately. No, he said, okay, this is what you've done. So you have this promise, and yet this is what you have done. All right, so let this have its full tenure. The people that you have killed because of your foolishness, let them die. The things that you have accrued because of your lack of understanding, let them happen. 1,290 days. So going back to the book of Nahum, chapter 3, verse 1. And then now we begin talking about woe to the bloody city. Because the abomination that maketh desolate was a blood that was shed in the church. Are you following me? And because the church fell, the nation also, also, talk to me, also, also fell. So now we entered the space we are in right now, which I noted for you that it is from verse 1 to verse 7. That is the space we are in right now, which is, of course, a blood pollution. And that blood has done a lot of things, a lot, a lot of things. which included two things. Look at verse 1. He says, uh, full of lies and robbery, which is a lie. That blood is responsible for a lie called grace and a robbery called confession. A lie called grace and a robbery called confession. So you are lied to in the name of grace. How is it that we die because we believe in grace, yet grace was manifested as an expression of mercy? Because he says, but God that is rich in, rich in what? Rich in mercy, right? So mercy has to mean grace. 
In other words, mercy means capacitation to apprehend, to lay hold of. So you are lied in the name of grace. You are told you can continue being foolish because there is grace. You can continue sinning because there is, there is grace. Grace became a lie. A blood converted the space of grace in this nation into a deceitful ground. And then now we enter the robbery where as long as you can confess, it is well. Who told you? Who told you that unless you can confess, it is well? Where is the space of reparations? Restitutions? Where is the space of the law? The law was removed. Because these cheap, sufficial confessions have come to remove the space of the law and legalities in the territory to cause us to continue living in folly and in foolishness. So the blood changed this space because in a space such as Kenya, grace is a space. Grace is a space. Possession is a space. So through grace you become, and through possession you are able to be facilitated. But then you have a falsehood and you have a robbery. The falsehood is that grace is cheapened to mean rebellion, and then robbery means that you will never keep anything. You have no possession because things are constantly being taken away from you. That is reversed in your life in Jesus' name. Then we enter debts. He says that there is no end of their corpses. Look at that scripture. There is no end of their corpses. That should be verse 3. There, should, there is no end of their corpses. So this land is characterized by deaths. The death of anointings. The death of calls, callings. And that's why he says that you are supposed to make your calling and election sure. When it is not sure, it has been killed in high places. There are certain spaces where the calling entered and it died. There are places you went to sing because you could sing, but they were not inviting you to sing. They were inviting you to kill that grace that is in you. So the realms of the spirit in this nation are full of carcasses. People that should have become prophets, should have become worshippers, should have become financiers, should have become all these things. The realm is full of corpses. You find people that begin to tell you, when I was young, when I was your age, I was doing this and that and this, and now they are doing nothing. What happened to you? You are shot down. What happened to you? You are decimated upon the spaces of your calling. And now, of course, the issue I've been picking with this mistress of witchcrafts that advances by harlotry. says she is a well-favored harlot. So there is a space that was created of a woman that would lay claim to pro prophecy and tell us that she is a prophetess. But in reality, she's a what? She's a harlot. Because we are not saying that there are no prophetesses. Anna was a prophetess, right? Buona sue sana. Buona tukuse sana. Deborah was a prophetess. We are not saying that there are no prophetesses. Because my wife is one. My wife is a prophetess. But these prophetesses of this age are harlots. This one specifically is a what? Is a harlot. And is a mistress of, of witchcrafts. So you have a woman manifesting herself as a witch in the realm of the church and a harlot at the same time. And she's the one that is the definition of the church space. I remember I was seated somewhere um, in, in, in someone's house and she was there. Uh, she had come to give her views on certain things that were happening in the nation. And she was saying, you know, I am a prophetess. And I hadn't spoken. You know me, I don't speak much. When I say Somebody spoke there and said, you know, this one is calling herself a prophetess. Who made her a prophetess? He said, I should tell my people what this guy has said. Because they usually say that I pick up fights with these people. I am not this person. I am not coming from the fellowship they are coming from. How are they able to pick that this person is actually a waste, a pseudo, right? A pseudo prophetess. How are they able to pick? Yet we are not coming from the same doctrinal background. My point exactly. Are you following me? So that description is very definite. The Lord appeared to my wife and uh, the Lord began to, to tell her exactly where in this city, the space where this woman has been sleeping with people. Says so this place, this is where she has been sleeping with people. And it is not men that defile her. She is the one that defiles men. Why? Why? Because she is coming from a space that is created from a blood, an abomination that causes the desolation and 
a carcass system of anointings that were slain, authorities, mouths of prophets that were killed. By the time she's coming, she's sitting on a seat that has already been prepared for her. So the only thing she can do is to defile you. If you sleep with her, you perish. She remains pushing her thing because it is an anointing. It is a consecration. When she practices halotry, she is consecrated in that dimension. You, you are sinning. <laughs> That's how powerful this thing has become. And until you come to that description as a nation, you are not flowing apostolically because these people now have seats. They have people that they have manifested in offices, in churches, to mirror and to perfect the work they have begun. Say spiritual wickedness huh? in heavenly places. Spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Giving birth to seeds of this harlot and this prophetic defilement across the territory. I anoint you to change the status quo in the name of Jesus Christ. So if this is the picture, look, this is the promise, the nexus of interest. This is a picture, the panorama of desecrations. So we have to talk about participatory election. So I'll just mention this quickly, that it is not everybody that is going to participate in the call to make Kenya better than populous know. All right, and how are we going to be better? We are going to be better because we are not going to fall like populous know. We are not going to be removed from the picture. It says, let not the hand of the enemy remove me. I love that scripture. Let not the hand of the enemy remove me. So we are not going to be removed like the way Egypt was removed from the space and from the spectrum of both the outworkings of the mystery called mankind and the destiny of a revelation called Christ. We shall not be removed in the name of Jesus Christ. I said, you shall not be removed. You shall not be removed. And that's what is taking us back to Isaiah chapter 8. Pardon me, chapter 61 from verse 8 to 11. And he says, I love judgment. The Lord loveth judgment. So that is a baptism of judgment. So who is going to take part? Uh -huh. Let's list them. Number one, those that are willing to be baptized by judgment. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 61. I want you to see who is going to take part. Because if, even if you are a Kenyan, there's a gospel you must receive for you to participate. He says, for, the, for I the Lord love judgment. That is one, two, verse nine. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles. Their seed shall be known. So number two, that is a seed showcase to the Gentiles. So the first one is the baptism of judgment. Number two, the seed showcase to the Gentiles. Number three, um, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. So number three, that is a garment of salvation. And number four, it says, as a bridegroom, verse 10, part B, decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So that is a bridegroom ornament and the bridal jewel. So who is going to participate? What we are calling participatory election. The baptism of judgment, those that shall be baptized by judgment. The seed showcase to the Gentiles, those that shall manifest seed against the Gentiles. Number three, the garment of salvation. Those that shall put on a garment called salvation. And number four, those that shall have the ornament of the bridegroom and a jewel of his bride a jewel of his bride. So the reasons to why I have been preaching in this city and I'll continue to preach. It's not just a vocation or what I do for a living. God is using my voice and my revelation to gather for himself this set of people. A people that can be baptized into judgment are people that can showcase seed to the Gentiles, are people that can put on a garment called salvation, and are people that can receive an ornament of the bridegroom and a jewel of the bride. Are you following me? That's why I'm teaching. So who shall come to this inheritance? The people that shall receive these four things. They are the ones that God has set aside to be able to stand on a plane of candidature. 
And this is what I call the candidature of possibilities. If you can fulfill these four things, you can be a candidate of these possibilities. Otherwise, you shall live a normal life and fulfill the scripture concerning which the preacher said that there is nothing new under the sun. So back in the day, we used to say, Veni vidi vici. I saw, I came, I, I conquered, right? But you are coming, you are sight, and you are conquest were all under in the realm, or rather were all in the realm of the flesh. So there's nothing extraordinary that you actually conquered. You came under a subjugation. You saw under a subjugation. And you conquered things that were also as subjugated as you had been subjugated. There is nothing new under the sun. So may God amplify this voice. May God amplify this message. In the name of Jesus Christ. We need people that can judge. I say we need people that can judge aright. In the name of Jesus Christ. Under the baptism of judgment. I said we need people that can become seed. We need people that can become seed. People that can be bathed. People that can influence societies and communities through expressions of extraordinary understanding. We need a generation that can put on a garment of salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ. Insist on salvation. Uh -huh. Exact salvation. Construct salvation. Go into the realms that be of God and download an infrastructure that can secure salvation in their day. In the name of Jesus Christ. We need an ornament and we need a jewel. That is why we are teaching this gospel. That's why we are writing. That is why we are on YouTube now. That is why we are on Twitter. That's why we are here twice a week. To be able to give God an opportunity to gather a people that can come to such a fold. If you come to such a fold, that is what in the natural is called Christ crucified in international. But in the spirit, it is a host that is marching on top of a space called the space of nations to lay claim for an inheritance that is better than popular snow. That is why you are here. And that is why we are preaching Christ crucified. Because when Jesus came, he cast the fig tree. When Christ is now come through Christ crucified expressions and manifestations, he is laying claim of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Else, wisdom. That's what he is doing. It would be very unfortunate if anybody listened to me and they thought we are just doing normal church. Because that would be very boring even for me. It wouldn't warrant this level of sacrifice and lifestyle. It wouldn't. I had to be part of something mega. Not because I feel mega, but because God considered me faithful and put me into this revelation. Art thou better than populars? No. You're not just in church, my friend. You're not just come for a Thursday fellowship. Art thou better than populars? Art thou better than populars? Oh, you're saying no. Are thou better than populars? <laughs> Let me just tell you one thing. Yeah. So, I, 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 I so moaned earlier today that I could not have sufficient time to decode for you First Corinthians chapter 5, uh, which actually is the manual of judgment. God will give me an opportunity to teach you this chapter so that you can be people that are able to judge. A heart that can judge, a mind that can judge. That is a manual of judgment. I'll take you through verse by verse. And I believe God has given me grace for that to be a textualist in all prophetic interpretation of scripture to show you what it means to judge accurately in your generation. However, I just found a verse here that is called the anatomy of judgment. It just summarizes the anatomy of judgment. It says, Christ, verse 7, our Passover is sacrificed for us. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. So that is the anatomy of judgment. So every act of judgment 
every speech that judges every speech that judges has that anatomy Christ wisdom Christ wisdom so Christ must become our wisdom so what is judging the Bible says that for the Lord loveth judgment so it is wisdom that is judging are you following me it says our our Passover our Passover that is selflessness our selflessness pass over pass over he passed over them though they were as sinful as the Egyptians he passed over them that is an act of mercy mercy is sacrifice sacrifice access why do we sacrifice to access access for us for us purpose for us purpose so wisdom selflessness mercy access and purpose so any decision that judges rightly incorporates wisdom selflessness mercy access and purpose so all that given the functionality of practice all that given the functionality of pragmatism is what you call accurate judgment wisdom selflessness mercy access and purpose given the functionality of pragmatism is what you call judgment <laughs> number two the seed showcase to the Gentiles so how do you become a seed because you must demonstrate seedship to the Gentiles so what is a Gentile a Gentile is any a atmosphere that is alien a Gentile is any atmosphere that is alien to the reality of covenant faith a Gentile is any atmosphere that is alien to the reality of covenant faith. How do you showcase seed, uh, seedship? Sorry. So three things there are important. Number one, doctrinal definition. Doctrinal definition. You become seed when you can carry somebody's doctrine. When you can exemplify somebody's doctrine. So you don't exemplify what you read in the Bible. You exemplify a doctrine. You become seed when you have a distinction of containment a distinction of containment because a grain of wheat is not a mustard seed so there is distinction of containment so when i look at you when i hear you when i live with you there are things you say there's a way you live that tell that jesus was among you right bonasesana because when they had had them right bonatukusesana they could tell that they had been with they could tell that they had been with Jesus the distinction of containment what does your heart contain what does your mind contain number 3 the anterior edge the anterior edge of swordship swordship from the word sword the anterior edge of swordship a seed showcase to the gentiles because every sword is double-edged every sword is double-edged so there is the anterior edge and there is the exterior edge the exterior edge judges outwardly the anterior edge judges inwardly so I will know that you are appointed for this assignment because you shall have an anterior edge in the manifestation of your sword in other words that you shall be able to judge good because most of us we judge what is compromise or what is evil but you must be able to judge good because good is interior and evil is exterior and your sword must have an anterior edge you must have the capacity to judge anteriorly you must judge good so this is evil judge it this is compromise judge it what about good don't leave it judge good judge good so the apostle said that he had nothing to do with people that were outside the household of faith, right? But he decided to judge those that are inside the household of, of faith. So that is why, just because we are together in church, does not mean that I am just going to roll with you. Judge good. Judge good. So if you have a mindset, an orientation, to stand aside and tell this good is not as good as it claims to be, if God can give you that grace, then you belong to me. 
This is your assignment. The garment of salvation. I'll just read this through. How do you put on the garment of salvation? Number one, dominion as the central interpretation of Christ. Dominion as the central interpretation of Christ. Number two, a mindset of absolute victory. Not 90% victory, not 70% victory, absolute victory. Garment of salvation. Number three, a classified wisdom of outwitting the enemy. A classified wisdom of outwitting the enemy. Number four, anointing functionaries or let's call them consolidated anointing functionaries of security. Take note of that phrase, consolidated anointing functionaries of security. Consolidated anointing functionaries of security. So for you to be saved and for you to save, because if you can be saved, you can save. For you to be saved and for you to save, dominion must become the central interpretation of Christ. You must have a mindset of absolute victory because 10% victory for the devil is enough for him to take you out. So you must have a 100% victory. Number three, you must have a classified wisdom of outwitting the enemy. The enemy will be outwitted by a wisdom that is equivalent to salvation. In our generation, the enemy will be outwitted by a wisdom that is equivalent to salvation. And lastly, consolidated anointing functionaries. So you consolidated, how are you saved? You consolidated anointing functionaries of security. You brought wisdom. You brought, you brought discernment. You brought the prophetic. You brought hearing God. All right? So one day when you are supposed to die in a road accident, you discerned. The other day you are supposed to be attacked by a flu. You perceived, right? You are supposed to be without money for the next three months. What did you do? You heard the Lord tell you, go and give this sacrifice in church so that you can be preserved from it. So what has preserved you at the end of the day or at the end of that year? A consolidation, right? Of anointing functionaries that ensure you are safe. So I told you, you don't need one thing. You need everything to make it. And if you can be saved, then you can save. Lastly, the bridegroom ornament. What is a bridegroom ornament? Wisdom. What is a bridal jewel? A world. So it is double W, double W, double W. No wonder the man of God standing before you tonight has a name standing with W. And the other one is M, which is simply an inverted W, come to think of it. Because you need a wisdom and a world. Take note of how you laugh because, because I can see the dimension in which you are, you are laughing. How funny what I've said actually is. Because these things are not just in the spirit, they're also in the natural, right? So what is the ornament of the bridegroom? Wisdom. Wisdom. You see, listen, um, we've been talking about the mandates and the destinies of nations. For a believer in the United States, huh? what do they need to understand? They need to understand, they need to understand grace. So the ornament given to them was, was grace. A believer in Abuja, Nigeria, needed to understand power, right, and authority. That was the ornament given to them. Our ornament is wisdom. Our ornament is wisdom. So if we meet Christ, even as a fellowship, Christ will give us what? Wisdom. So every other thing is consistent, and it evens out. The presence of God, right? Holiness, are you following me? The law of the spirit, everything is supposed to even out. But the distinctions come in when you're talking about the destinies of nations. So we all stand here. I have grace and I have power, but my distinction is wisdom. Are you following me? They are not supposed to forfeit wisdom, but they should also they should have power, and the other one should not forfeit wisdom and power, but they should have what? Grace. But my distinction is wisdom. 
the ornament of the bridegroom is wisdom for me as a Kenyan for me as a member of this ministry saying that I preach Christ crucified the jewel of the bride the jewel of the bride is a world the jewel of the bride is a world what we owe the earth is a world tell your neighbor for me you owe the earth a world and in case they think they are small let me know so I deal with them right here you owe the earth a world just as populous know which is a few kilometers from here in Nairobi Cairo is a few kilometers from here we can trek actually they gave the earth a world you owe the earth a world where I appear there should be a world and that is why the leader of the United Nations should be a Kenyan because we are the ones that are giving the earth a world talk to me the president of the United States should have Kenyan roots because it already happened because we are giving the earth a world this this person that begins to command the territories of China should be a Kenyan because you are giving the earth a, a world the person who finally begins to decipher the kingdoms of the sea for us should be a Kenyan because it is us that are giving the earth the next world so the next world is not with AI eh? the next world is not a Chinese world the next world is a Kenyan world it is a Kenyan world it is not a metaverse and any other verse in the name of Jesus Christ I'm saying something it will not be informed by spring theory if you know spring theory eh? and string theory you know string theory hmm? okay you don't read much right one other idea so it will not be informed by string theory it shall not be informed by the kingdoms of the sea it shall be informed by by Kenya we are the ones that are giving it says green climate such a vibe and a rhetoric in Europe right now but we are the people that have authority over climate the next world is ours the next world is ours that is the jewel of the bride I'm saying something it is a jewel of the it is a jewel of the of the bride so today I came to lay claim for the blessedness of the Kenyan church space I came to open your eyes to see where you are right now not look at this room and how small it is but look up to heaven because that which is from above is above all and begin to see the capacities uh, and the potencies that have been given to us by grace that you may begin to open your eyes and see it because some of you when we begin to pursue you to give us money for partner community hmm, we are bothering you but you don't realize that this is what we are financing and it's very important for us to talk about these things because you know me when I'm asking for money from you this is what I have in mind are you following me but prior to this day you did not have this in mind so you you are recording deductions you when your money hits my mpesa i am counting ascensions into a state where i am better than popular snow may god touch some hearts here you know as preachers we are known for rhetoric and the things that we have hmm, conjectured the excellencies of conjecture upon our tables in our studies eh? what will I tell them today fix this up bring this verse eh? conclude like this this is not a normal preacher preaching to you I came to raise a cry in the name of Jesus Christ just bow your head for a minute and thank God for what you've heard Oh, Holy Ghost. <laughs> Thank you, Spirit of the Lord. <laughs>